There we go. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Dustin Vager, and uh, I kind of wear a few different uh, hats, but uh, for the purposes of this conversation, for the last seven years, I've been working on uh, urban tr an urban tree nursery project here in the city called Forest City Plants, uh, mostly started by finding interesting local varieties of plants. Um, and a lot of it is driven by the vision that I have to uh, think of to take these two systems here to take a city and to take the natural environment and to merge them together because I actually think that a lot of the problems that we associate with cities, uh, be it pollution or uh, hardscaping, um, which causes flooding if it you know lands on uh, roads don't soak up uh, water or uh, concrete heats up during the day. And so some of the challenges that we experience in cities, I think, can actually be mitigated by uh, integrating the natural world into it. And, and so about seven years, I started growing plants, uh, mostly trees, uh, woody, uh, woody plants, so shrubs as well. And um, I ended up with hundreds of trees in the backyard. I'm going to show you a little bit of that process um, here. But my kind of goal or vision is to as I just said, stitch these things together, stitch cities together with the built environment so that we can create spaces that are really the partnership of the two. I, um, I've i been on this rent for many years. And so if I've gone on it before, uh, please forgive me. But um, I think that uh, ecosystems, forests in particular are amazing because they're made up of all of the connections and relationships within them. And the end of every single process is the beginning of another. And cities seem, like they're the opposite of that perhaps, but I would argue that the reason why people are attracted to cities, the reason why, um, uh, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of people's moving, people moving to cities globally is because cities represent their own connections. There's, a, there's social connections, there's economic connections, and much in the same way that a forest is a place for maximizing connections, a city is a place for maximizing connections. And uh, while, um, and, and I think if you can take all of the connections and relationships that you find in one of these systems and, and, and in the other, and you can stitch them together, you have what ecologists might call an ecotone. So you actually get um, all of the connections and relationships of one, all of the connections and relationships of another. And like a forest meeting a lake, you have all of these opportunities for new connections. And uh, so this is sort of a vision that I've been very passionate about uh, going on 20 years now. And um largely, I think, took off um, when I discovered this plant. So this is uh, a picture of the Capilano apricots, which were uh, seeds taken from, uh, actually sent to Alberta from Harbin, China, grown out at the Brooks Research Station in Southern Alberta, and then gorilla gardened on the streets of Edmonton. And so there's two trees left. Uh, sadly, one of them passed away recently, but they're these amazing sort of local apricots that nobody really knows much about or knew much about. And I became obsessed with trying to find the origins of this. Um, actually, if you're interested in that, look up uh, look up Chris Chang and Phillips um, uh, Let's Find Out podcast and search for the Capilano apricot uh, episode. He goes through the details. But uh, I gathered 100 pits from this. And of course, I got there after everybody uh, picked all the pits, but I got on my hands and knees and picked through the grass and managed to find 100 pits and planted them out on the side of my house and totally forgot about them. And the following spring, uh, I had 96 little apricot trees. Uh, I was doing a little bit of routine weeding and I said, wait a minute, all of these things here are all in a straight line. And I was like, oh my God, the apricots I planted. And it turned into this little apricot forest planted about that far apart where they grew for, um, for, for that entire season. And the following year, they were, oops, and the following year uh, were gently removed, uh, bare root, uh, repotted, and basically um, are now all over uh, the city of Edmonton. And I thought, wow, if you can do that with, um, you know, a hundred apricot pits that you pick up off of the, off of a lawn, um, there's like, there's something here that, that experiment too, from Harbin, China is now something that like, that carries on. Uh, and so for the past seven years, I have been, uh, interested in propagating all kinds of, um, local plants that aren't very common. So things like those apricots, but also finding all sorts of things like Japanese quince and um, uh, 
uh, ooh, uh, black and white walnuts. Uh, and then I've been bringing in uh, some things that I think should grow here uh, and, and giving them a shot. So the what plants on the right here are pawpaws. That's still an experiment. I've had some marginal, but marginal success growing pawpaws. The one on the left is a plant that you'll find uh, in the city of Edmonton, but these are bristlecone pines. I throw them in here because I have kind of a, a dream of growing 1000 bristlecone pines um, because they can live over a thousand years. Uh, send me a message if that sounds like something you'd be interested in. Uh, here are some uh, American chestnuts. If you know anything about American chestnuts, they're essentially functionally extinct in their native range due to a blight that's wiped them out. But we're far enough uh, west and far enough north that we are uh, geographically separated from that blight. And uh, I think in the right place, these little uh, American chestnuts uh, do fine. And I had been selling these. I still sell the occasional plant. But um, really what, what I found more interesting was taking this passion for plants and sharing it with others. And so last winter, uh, I hosted a plant propagation course, teaching other people how to grow plants. Everybody got some seeds. And from fall until spring, we scarified our seeds and stratified our seeds. Fancy ways of saying that we prepared them uh, uh, to plant out. And in the spring, we all ended up with 50 little trees and, you know, really like, 600 new trees out of a little propagation course. And um, my, my back, an aspect of my background that I haven't talked about is, is I come from, um, I'm, a, I'm a high school teacher. And so it kind of occurred to me that, uh, wow, we have, we have the opportunity to have a, you know, a, a community of a distributed community of backyard tree growers growing literally thousands of trees. And that could have a really big impact on communities here in Edmonton. And so out of that came this idea of uh, shrub scriber, which is, it's a weird word to say, I'm still working on it myself, shrub scriber, shrub scriber, but it's essentially a plant subscription service. And so we have formed this little community about six months ago uh, with the idea that the membership fee for the community actually pays for the propagation of plants, as well as working with schools and community groups to, to, to give them uh, access to those plants for free. And so uh, we have members funding three, six, or 12 uh, trees per year. And uh, we are now in the process of going out and finding community groups to donate these trees to, um, uh, which, which really kind of led me to. Um, the King's Group, uh, because if we have, let's say, thousands of trees to donate, a big question becomes, where should these trees go? And so one answer could be into the hands of anybody who wants one. Um, but I think we can get a little bit more targeted here. What if we took a look at data like um, so like food deserts. So where are the food deserts in the city of Edmonton? A food desert is often described as a location or a neighborhood that um, is not within walking distance or, a or is a certain uh, distance away from like a, a supermarket or a grocery store. Uh, but maybe we could get uh, trees into some of those locations. Not that an apricot tree is going to necessarily replace a grocery store. That's kind of ridiculous. But, you know, might there be some opportunities to tackle uh, food insecurity? Uh, or might there be opportunities to partner with community gardens in order to uh, get them access to uh, a variety of interesting plants. Um, oop, I think I missed a slide here. Yep. Uh, another one that I was really interested in uh, is uh, the city's uh, flood, flood maps. So this is now publicly available. Uh, everything in red here are common areas that flood. You can see McKernan Lake uh, in the middle of the McKernan neighborhood. Uh, goes to show you that if you drain a lake and you build a neighborhood in it, you still live at the bottom of a lake. Um, but, you know, might there be ways uh, to target tree planting in a way, uh, in ways that mitigate uh, flood risks? So could you plant trees, let's say, up a hill of, uh, of really hard hit areas, and might that have an impact? Now, that's a bit of a hypothesis. I don't actually know if that's the case, and I think more research needs to be done. Uh, another hunch that I had is uh, we know that urban environments heat up uh, because of 
you know, the excess amount of concrete or, or dark surfaces. And we know that this causes our, our cities to be much warmer than the surrounding areas. Now, in Edmonton on a minus 30 day, that maybe sounds nice, uh, but there's actually some really big risks associated with this that, that the group is going to talk about. And so another hunch that I had is, well, maybe if we were strategic about where we handed plants out to, we could give plants to the areas that were hardest hit by urban heat island. And uh, I thought, okay, well, I don't actually know how to do that. <laughs> so I've got lots of plants and I've got a community of people that, that, that are, that are, you know, helping um, get these plants into the hands of communities. But uh, if the goal is to get them into the places that could use them the most, then I'm going to have to bring in some people who have those skills. And uh, it was very fortuitous that around that time I was contacted by King's University um, and wanted to know if I was if I'd be interested in partnering around uh, partnering with with a group of students. And I said, well. Uh, I actually it would be looking for somebody to do a little bit of uh, urban heat island mapping in the city of Edmonton, and uh, was thus very fortunate to meet uh, the students who join me tonight as co-hosts. And so I'm actually going to turn the microphone and the um, slide deck over to them, and they're going to share with you um, a presentation that they did for me at the end of their project. Uh, they're going to detail the process that they went through, some of the things that they uncovered, and then um, we'll kind of jump back in. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, maybe some of the implications or other questions that we might have, and then we'll open it up to the group for, for some, for some Q&A. So on, on that note, uh, I'm going to pass it over to the King's University group. Just gonna share my screen. All right, hi everyone. I'm Julia and I'm joined today by my group members, Emmanuel and Christy. So as Dustin mentioned, we are members, we are students of the King's University, which is a Christian liberal arts university located in Edmonton. And one of the major parts of our mission at King's is um, pursuing justice, both social and environmental. So in this case, we do that often through community engaged research, which of course is why we're working with Dustin and Shrubscriber. So to be more specific, we are a group of senior environmental studies students. And um, it's really unique at King's. The environmental studies program is very interdisciplinary. So among us, we have, we're all environmental studies majors but we have minors in biology, computing science, and psychology. So kind of a very diverse group here, which worked very well for this project. So in our capstone course, we were presented with a variety of options for different potential projects. And we decided to partner with Shrubscriber both as mentioned, because it involves GIS. And also when we were talking with Dustin, he kind of introduced some of the different things that we could look at. And we really wanted to look at the relationship between trees and heat in Edmonton. We thought that'd be very interesting. So this is just a little introduction to the problem, which I'm gonna hand over to Christy now. All right. Well, thank you, Dustin, for telling us all about Shrubscriber and your tree planting efforts and how that all got started. It's, it's really awesome work. So we're just so glad that we get to work with you on that. And thanks, Julia, for the intro. So yes, hello, everyone. I'm Christy, and I'm the biology uh, minor. And I will be talking through the main problems and potential solutions that we uncovered through this project. So how to define an urban heat island? Well, it's a metropolitan or urban area experiencing warmer temperatures um, in comparison to its, to its surroundings. So this is the urban heat island map of Edmonton, where colors indicate temperature, making it quite clear that it's a very serious issue that we as a city are facing. Um, so what causes them? Well, cities have become heat sinks because of three main factors. The first is heat absorptive surfaces. So roofs, roads, and sidewalks, things like asphalt and concrete have very high thermal masses, meaning they absorb and release large quantities of heat. 
The second factor, as uh, Dustin kind of mentioned, is waste heat and emissions from houses, buildings, vehicles, and factories. So CO2 or carbon dioxide is a well-known greenhouse gas that when it becomes very abundant in the atmosphere, as it is in cities, it traps the solar radiation that would otherwise have been emitted back into space. And this causes an atmospheric warming effect. So during a heat wave in Edmonton this summer, Edmonton's power consumption reached record-breaking summertime highs. And this actually forced Alberta's electric systems operator to declare a state of emergency. So this highlights a very vicious cycle where in cities, when the temperatures are increasing, we're cranking the air conditioning, everyone's um, turning on their cooling fans, and that's creating more waste heat, which contributes to the problem of increased temperature in the first place. Just to kind of put that into perspective, last year in Beijing during a heat wave, 50% of the power capacity of the entire city was just going towards air conditioning at that time. So it's a huge, um, huge energy sink. And then the last one, why cities have become so hot is a lack of vegetation and tree cover. So the effects of urban heat islands are not uniform across the entire city and hot spots exist usually in places with more exposed concrete and fewer trees. And why is this a problem? Well, in a broad context, urban heat islands contribute to global warming and then are in turn exasperated by global warming because heat waves and other extreme weather events increase in frequency and intensity. And yes, of course, heat waves are felt by everyone, but they are far more detrimental to the lives and environments in urban spaces because of those already elevated temperatures. So as cities are continuing to grow and expand across the globe, the cumulative effects of urbanization have become detrimental to all life forms and ecosystem processes. And since unfortunately, we can only expect events such as heat waves to become more frequent, more intense, more long lasting, cities will continue to be disproportionately affected by this growing threat. So the first threat I'm gonna talk about is the risk to human health. So one kind of fact that especially Canadians are pretty surprised by is that more people die each year when temperatures are above 30 than they do when temperatures are below 30. So we definitely witnessed this in Edmonton this summer. Um, paramedics responded to just under 300 heat related calls during that heat wave. So just between June 28th and July 4th, emergency rooms were full of heat stress patients and the average death tolls of that week were actually quite high in comparison to, to past summers. The elderly and the youth are at greater risk of heat-related illnesses, which is often experienced through weakness, dizziness, exhaustion, and then in the severe cases you get comas, organ failure, and then death. It's also the people and communities, unfortunately, that do not have access to proper housing, proper um, water supplies, and cooling systems that are most affected by these rising temperatures in cities. So again, highlighting that that gap between the marginalized vulnerable communities versus those who are more privileged and comfortable in their living spaces. Next, I'll talk about the ecological significance. Awesome. So urban wildlife, vegetation, things like soil microbes and water bodies are all other ecosystem processes that are suffering from the heat as well. It's important to not ignore those. And especially when urban heat islands are contributing to this unnatural rate of climatic changes. So yes, nature is known to evolve, but the limiting factor to evolution is time. And with these unprecedented rates of change, there's just not enough time for the developments of structural and behavioral adaptations in animals and in plants that are needed to survive these, these crazy drastic changes. And then considering that urban spaces are already quite uninhabitable for most wildlife species, just because of the disturbance and land change and habitat degradation, uh, the volatility and temperature only makes that problem worse as well. And the loss of vegetation due to heat stress in cities is very problematic, especially since trees and green spaces are our greatest sources of cooling. So urban heat islands are clearly a current issue, but it's also important to note that it's an issue that will only get worse uh, if drastic measures are not taken to mitigate these effects and risks. Which brings us to our solutions. So our research suggested these two primary solutions for cooling down cities. The first is increasing the reflectivity of surfaces. So this is as simple as painting roofs, sidewalks and roads white, but this one's a little controversial because in Edmonton, we rely on these dark surfaces to melt the snow and ice in the winter. 
So it's kind of a safety hazard, but in, you know, cities like California where snow and ice aren't a threat, then absolutely we should be implementing this, this, these color changes. And the second one is planting trees. So trees induce cooling through evapotranspiration and shade, which is kind of explained in the next slide. So transpiration cooling occurs because surrounding heat is absorbed both during the evaporation and transpiration processes, while the trees release, release cool air as the water evaporates from their leaves. So this reduces ambient air temperature by eight degrees Celsius. And then shade reduces the short wave radiation at ground level by anywhere between 60 to 90%. So this really highlights the importance of trees for not only combating urban heat islands, but heat waves and even global warming as a whole. So we are interested in cooling down the city as a whole for sure, but it's, we're also interested in acknowledging the hot spots across the city because it's important to focus any solution on areas that experience the highest temperatures in order to reduce those disproportionate health and environmental impacts that are occurring there. So that's why our project is focused on identifying the hottest and least tree neighborhoods throughout the city to maximize the urban tree planting initiatives that Shrubscriber and other tree planting organizations are undertaking in Edmonton. So yeah, our project goals. The first was to create an urban heat map um, of Edmonton because that's actually something that no one has ever done before. So that's completely new and fresh data, which was really exciting. And the second was to integrate data on publicly owned trees onto that map so that we could use temperature and tree density to identify the vulnerable residential neighborhoods for Shrubscriber. So next we'll be going through kind of just adding more details on how we created that map in GIS using the hackathon process, how we found the average temperatures for each neighborhood and then calculated the density of publicly owned trees so that we could kind of pull it all together into these scatter plots that point out exactly the target neighborhoods that were experiencing the highest temperatures due to a lack of trees. I will pass, pass it on now. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Julia. My name is Emmanuel. I'm the computer science concentration student. And for this part of the presentation, I will take you through like the technical process kind of in which we used to get our urban heat um, islands, our heat map, and um, the general map of which we use for recommendations. Before that, um, I have to explain for you GIS. Um, as stated earlier, we used the hackathon process to get our final maps, but the hackathon process is find, found in GIS. GIS is basically a geographic informative system, and it's exactly what the name says. Geography information through a system. It's taking data, um, analyzing data, and making it into an information. As you can see through the images on the right hand side, it's multiple layers of data that eventually make sense. And I'll explain it further because we had um, a final um, integrated data, which was our final um, map. And that was through the process of taking each and individual maps, which was our heat island, uh, neighborhood um, temperatures, and the tree data we, we found. To get our um, heat island, we had to go through numerous processes. Um, first is questioning where to get the heat island. And if we had to create the heat island on our own, we try to get data from the government, but unfortunately it's something where we each um, station, each temperature station in the city just gives you a general idea of what the temperature is in the area. And as we said, uh, subscriber was trying to get more detailed based on community and neighborhoods. So that wouldn't work. So we had to turn to NASA to get this image right in front of you. Um, basically, this is an infrared image, and it is, mm, in layman's term, just a photograph of the heat of Edmonton. So it's just a picture, but instead of showing um, details, it just shows the amount of heat being emitted per area, cells uh, in, in the city. The heat reflection shows um, Edmonton and the surrounding areas. 
just by looking at it, I don't think I have to explain <laughs> where Edmonton is, although I will still show it in the next slide. But yeah, this um, made us to peruse through numerous infrared images until we finally landed on that one. And then we got to creating our heat map. From the image you saw, we were able to calculate each infrared image, change it into um, temperature and degree Celsius, and it's now gave us something to work, work with. As you can see from here, the legend, I know most people have already seen the map, but the legend shows you in detail the graduated heat in each area of the city. Um, temperatures went as high as 32 degrees and went as low as 12 degrees. If you're seeing an overlap in the legend, it's basically because you cannot tell when the temperature changes. It just, it's a continuous legend that just shows you that the temperature moves from um, one area to another. Um, this map in particular works with cells, which is very tiny boxes, if I should say, generating heat um, towards the infrared camera. And the cells, uh, it's not like individual persons, but um, it could be said like the heat in your particular home that was coming out of your house or coming out from a place in the road and everything was captured individually. However, this information was not good enough to give us what we're still looking for, which is neighborhood data um, to specify communities. And so we had to, on our own average, each neighborhood cells, and then we got this map, which is the av um, average temperature of each neighborhood. Now, the beauty about this is if we wanted more details, we could use the map you've seen um, previously. And if you want a more um, wider perspective of neighborhoods that are really in use, you could use this um, map that shows um, both the cool areas and the really hot areas. If you can notice, most of the areas around the river are cool down because of the numerous amount of trees. And the, should I say, home clusters and industrial clustered areas have more heat. Upon getting the average neighborhood temperatures, we decided to uh, compare this with our publicly owned tree data. Um, and this data is not individual trees. It's the average density, density by, um, by neighborhood of trees. Um, just to explain to anyone who doesn't truly really understand how to read maps, the greener it is, the better. It has enough trees, not say enough, but you know, it's better than the places with least, um, less amount of, of trees. This way we were able to compare and contrast both all tree maps and to get our final um, integrated map, which showed us um, the heat areas and the trees. So based on the map you saw previously, which were the trees, it was changed to symbologies, uh, as you can see of may, more trees and it will, it was put in like a graduated symbology where places with no trees, not no trees, less amount of trees and places with, uh, where it had smaller trees in it and places with higher amount of trees had bigger um, trees based on the symbology. This helped us to try and um, compare in our findings, which Julie will talk about, all the areas that had more heat and less um, and less trees to be able to get to our solutions. Julie. All right. So now I want to talk a little bit about our findings, limitations, and recommendations, beginning with our findings. So this is our zoomed out heat map of Edmonton, which of course demonstrates the temperature difference between the city and the surrounding areas. So a later version of this map, of course, has the scale, but as Emmanuel stated, yeah, there's like a temp temperature difference from 12 degrees to 32 degrees Celsius. And as also stated, 
we got our data from just one day, which was June 24th, 2021. And on this day, the average temperature in Edmonton was recorded at 24 degrees. So you get a sense of the difference observed throughout the city. And as Christy mentioned, this is the first heat map of Edmonton, which is quite an interesting thing and part of the reason why we wanted to see if we could do that. So moving on to our map of average temperatures by neighborhood, we see several trends, including kind of a hot spot in the northeast corner of the city and patterns of cooling around the outskirts of the city, as well as along the rivers and ravines, which of course, as Emmanuel said, can be explained by trees as well as the cooling effect of water. So in the previous figures, the maps that we made, we established the reality of Edmonton's urban heat island. But unfortunately, when we tried to overlay the tree data to establish if there was a relationship between trees and heat in Edmonton, we had some problems. So this scatter plot shows Edmonton's residential neighborhoods only, where the density of publicly owned trees is on the x-axis and the average temperature is on the y. So if the two variables had been related the way that we thought, pretty much all the neighborhoods would have lined up in a rough diagonal line from the top left to the bottom right corner of the image. And in that box there, that would be where we would have found our, our ideal neighborhoods. But as you can see, we did not see the trend that we expected. And also that box is more empty than we had hoped. So we really began to think about what some of the issues were that we encountered. So the most, specific, the most significant reason we could find for our results was our limited access to data. The first problem we had is that we could only access temperature data from the one day, June 24th, because as Emmanuel explained, to do this, you need a land surface temperature image, which of course, because it's taken by a satellite, you need to have a perfectly clear cloudless day where you can see all of the land surface. And because we were really kind of inspired by the heat wave this summer, we wanted to make sure that we found an image from a day this summer that was over 21 degrees Celsius. So this was the only image we could find. And as it turned out, this image took like a few days to download. So in the end, we were, we were very happy to just have even one. And then the even bigger problem we had with access to data was that we could only find information on trees owned by the city of Edmonton. As you know, homeowners are free to plant as many trees on their property as they want. And there is no record at all of how many trees are in each specific neighborhood. So we did include tree density data, but because it's only publicly owned trees, it's not very representative at all, unfortunately, not very reflective of how many trees there are in neighborhoods. So to find a more accurate representation of tree cover, we would have had to do something called an unsupervised classification on a satellite image, which involves sorting out different types of land cover by reflectivity. This is a very cool process, and we highly recommend it for anyone in the future who may want to do a similar thing. But given the scope of our project and our timeline, there was just uh, no way, especially with the issues we had sourcing our, our temperature data. So combine these data problems with the equal with extra ecological variables like proximity to water, which of course would have a cooling effect and human error because the hackathon process kind of failed us halfway through and we had to manually calculate averages. That took like four hours of pairs of us sitting at the computer. There's always human error. So we did not find a strong correlation in our data, but given the well-documented relationship in other cities, we still feel confident in sharing our two main recommendations from the project. So our first official recommendation fulfills our project goal, which was to identify residential neighborhoods experiencing the highest average temperatures and lowest tree densities for shrub scriber. We used the scatter plot that you saw earlier to identify neighborhoods which fit these criteria. To this end, we recommend the neighborhoods Rundle Heights, McConaughey area, Canosa, Secord, Killarney, Bannerman, Kensington, Ottawell, Limburn, Linwood, and York be considered as top priority for receiving shrub scriber trees. Our second recommendation draws from our data on the city as a whole, as seen in this scatter plot of all Edmonton neighborhoods that we had temperature and tree density data for. Of all the neighborhoods in Edmonton, the industrial areas best fit our prediction about the relationship between trees and heat. And many of these areas had a public tree density of less than one tree per square kilometer. And of course, they experienced some of the highest temperatures in Edmonton. 
Of course, this map didn't, this graph didn't show the same relationship either, but you can see that there are more in that top left corner where we were looking for. So for this reason, our, we also recommend that our data be used to advocate for more public trees to be planted by the city all over Edmonton, but especially in industrial areas. As, as Christy mentioned, reducing the impact of the urban heat island in this area would likely have the most impact on the city as a whole. So our hope for this project entirely is that through the efforts of shrub scriber in residential neighborhoods and the city in industrial neighborhoods, we can begin to reduce the effects of Edmonton's heat island. And of course, further research into Edmonton's heat island <laughs> will be an important part of this, especially ones that cover the variables that we couldn't account for. So to that end, we will be willing to share our data with anyone who would be willing to take that extra step forward. And I will now pass it back to Dustin. Justin, I think you're muted. Oh, I've been doing this for two years and I'm still talking on mute. Uh, I, what I did say was thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, I'm gonna jump back in here and share, uh, share my screen. Um, okay. So, um, oops, I'm going all over the place. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I think that this data here um, is a really great first step in being able to start to think about how uh, urban heat island is impacted um, various parts of the city. I also think that there's there's probably lots of questions that can come out of this. And so as was just mentioned, if there are um, people in the audience or you know of people that would uh, love to have access to this data and to be able to expand upon it. Uh, I think that that's the kind of work that we would uh, all encourage. Um, just uh, for a little bit more context, I have been working with um, other groups. And so uh, I do have a lovely group of Capstone students at Nate who uh, have actually taken the work that uh, was started at King, specifically the average neighborhood temperatures, and they started taking a look at a little bit of the social data. King's uh, the King students mentioned early on in their presentation that there are certain groups that are uh, especially uh, hard hit by urban heat island. So two of those in particular were the elderly and um, uh, young children, as well as people uh, working or, or living on, on the streets. And so they took a little bit of that social data and uh, they came up with a little bit of their own list here. And so it's interesting to see how they kind of compare and contrast with um, with some of the recommendations set out by Kings. And so uh, I just put this slide in here just to, just to say that as we pull in more data and as, as we keep thinking about, um, you know, the various aspects of of this this challenge, um, you know, I think that we can make arguments for for different communities and for helping them out. Uh, I also uh, I want to get to the questions really quickly, but um, I want to point out just a few city of Edmonton documents. Um, this one here comes back to 2013, but the city's food and urban agriculture strategy. Uh, and so I, I do think that doing something like targeted tree planting, uh, embracing nature in the city as not just a nice to have, but actually as, a, as, uh, as important green infrastructure, I think fortunately is the kind of thing that, um, you know, that, that shows up in our city documents, in our planning documents. And so I do think that there's very, it's very much in alignment with things like fresh or um, the energy transition strategy or uh, the new city plan. And so um, that's always very, very hopeful because I think if we can bring together, you know, this built environment, this place that we call the city of Edmonton and that the natural world, and then of course the community that lives and, and participates in it, I think that you can end up with something um, really interesting. And so that is, you know, what subscriber hopes to do even in a modest kind of way. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we've, you know, we're about six months old as a project. Uh, we've got about 51 subscribers and have funded uh, 251 trees. And so we're presently in the process of finding homes for those trees. We did plant some in the fall, uh, in particular uh, donated some trees to uh, WP Wagner High School. Um, but if you are a school or a community group, uh, or in one of those neighborhoods that was mentioned um, uh, and you're looking for trees for your project, please um, reach out. And then of course, if you would like to help um, 
uh, get involved in subscriber and uh, fund trees or learn how to grow trees and uh, get those out into your community, uh, definitely uh, send us a message. But at this point, I would love to um, open up the uh, the chat for questions. Um, I suspect that we're going to have kind of lots in here. Um, and we'll see what we can answer in the next 12 or so minutes before we send everybody off to bed. I see a couple hands that are up. Um, we could do this in a few different ways, I guess. Um, in the chat works fine, as kind of how I was imagining it. But let me let me jump over to Anissa and um, I'll, I'll give you the floor. We'll, we'll try to answer a few that way, maybe. I might have missed this part in the presentation, but I was wondering in some of those neighborhood where higher temperatures were recorded, such as um, C, C. Cybecker that stood out to me, for example, um, were the number of trees in that neighborhood uh, documented? So is it a matter of maybe there's the same amount of trees as in some of the neighborhoods where the temperature might be cooler, but just that perhaps they're just not mature enough? So have the numbers of trees been documented just to, to verify or actually um, attest to, yes, these neighborhoods do need more trees? That's, that's a really good question, right? So the maturity of the trees hasn't been taken into account. And so you might have, uh, I, I think that's, that's a brilliant question because now you have a situation where perhaps in older, more mature neighborhoods, um, the, the canopy itself is more mature. And so you have um, those larger trees, even if there's few of them, are, are pulling more, more weight. And perhaps in some of the less mature neighborhoods, you have the opposite, where you have maybe lots of trees, but they're less mature. Um, that is not taken into account with the number of, or the, the tree density. I think a really great data set to have would be um, just canopy cover, right? And so if we could take a look at at how much canopy coverage we have in a particular neighborhood. I, I, I suspect that if we ran the, you know, did that scatter plot again, we would see more of a correlation. But I, I think that's an, like an excellent point. The other thing too is, okay, so um, this neighborhood needs a bunch of trees. So do we get out there and we plant, I don't know, let's say a thousand little trees. Well, it might take, you know, a few decades before the, um, effects of those trees are really felt. And so uh, it's it's kind of a, a slow process. Doesn't mean it's not worth doing, but that is uh, very much worth recognizing. So yeah, great, great question and great point. Um, let's jump over to Mary Ellen. Hey, Dustin. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Uh, awesome presentation, great project, um, fascinating. I happen to live in one of those neighborhoods that desperately needs more trees. And so I'm, I'm looking to connect with you to see how I can help facilitate that in my own neighborhood near, near Randall Heights. Um, but uh, with regards to the mapping, I'm just curious as to what resolution of, of land cover uh, map you would need in order to do the canopy cover um, correlation. Because we do, we do have a uh, available, like very recently, six meter resolution land cover data sets. We can help connect you to get that information. I don't know if that's that's high enough resolution, but at least that exists for. I mean, for. I yeah. would. I would. Um, with, I, I don't know enough about <laughs> about about the process to to. I know enough to be dangerous. So uh, someone like Emmanuel would be a, would be a good person to to connect with. But my hunch is that yes, that it would would be useful. It certainly, I think, would be a much more granular than um, just using the you know the number of city owned trees, right? So mm -hmm. I mentioned in the chat the city of Edmonton has an estimated twelve point eight million trees, and three hundred eighty thousand of them are city owned. So the vast majority of them are. Are um, are private trees or trees in the in the river valley or park systems, and so um, yeah, none of, none of that is taken into account. So even something at a six meters uh, kind of pixel would would probably be uh, infinitely more um, granular than than what we have at the moment. Cool. All right, I'm gonna try okay. to connect you with we, that. Thanks. We yeah. use the seventy meter resolution, so six meter resolution will be very very helpful. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Yang Guan has, uh, has, has had their hand up for a little bit. Hi, um, 
Uh, it's, um, my name is Faye. Hey, Faye. Um, <laughs> I thought it might be you. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm, I'm wondering if uh, Dustin, if you can share that um, link, the, the map and the data that where the, the link to, I, 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 is it in City of Edmonton website? It's not in the city of Edmonton website, though. Since um, posting the um, this event, uh, uh, the Change for Climate folks have reached out. I think creating a, a heat map was on their radar, and so that might be uh, an organization or a group in particular that might be able to pick up pick this up and and continue to run with it. Um, and so I think it would be great if some iteration of this or, or, or the, the data as it stands ends up being uh, publicly accessible. We are 100% open and willing to do that. It's just, it's it's not up right now. Also, it's in like, a lot of it is in like ArcGIS files, which um, once again is beyond my capability. And so I don't know if there's particular formats or uh, maybe something like Tableau or something that might allow people to sort of zoom in and zoom around. but. Um, yeah, that getting getting that data up um, and accessible, uh, I think, will be a priority going forward. Yeah, uh, yeah, that would be something that I will be uh, willing to like um, share with my community and talk about that uh, the map and the area that that the, the target heat area. I'm also wondering uh, about the uh, the concrete surface. Um, I don't know if you are already uh, think about and um, talk to the uh, city about like in order to plant some tree in those uh, heated areas. That mean will be some of the concrete will be removed by plant the tree in there or and also the rooftop. Is it possible to plant? things on the rooftop? On well, rooftops, yeah. So rooftop rooftop gardens are a thing um, and there are some examples of them within the city of Edmonton, but it's not something that we've, we've largely adopted. I know that there are, as an example in Toronto, uh, buildings of a certain square footage are required to have uh, some green roofs. So we know that green roofs, you know, treat or not, um, uh, do do help mitigate um, heat island as well as as well as uh, runoff during floods and so um, uh, they're out there but there's nothing that kind of mandates them but but they would help and perhaps something like an urban heat island map like this urban heat island map might help make that case going forward right it might say hey you want to build a big industrial building like you know you need you need to like paint the roof white at the very least. Uh, in terms of in terms of like daylighting, like actually pulling up concrete, um, that's a little bit more challenging, right? Like a lot of that that hard infrastructure is there for moving or or um, you know, or physical buildings itself. Um, but uh, I know that there's been talk in the past about daylighting parts of uh, Mill Creek Ravine. Um, maybe this is something like I, my neighborhood is about to go through neighborhood renewal. Somebody mentioned that Otwell, which was one of the neighbor, one of the neighborhoods that was, was on the map is about to go through neighborhood renewal. And so maybe something like an urban heat island map could, uh, inform how those neighborhood renewals, uh, proceed. Right. So, um, which is something that, that, that seems important to me. Um, I mean, not just because my neighborhood is, is about to go through this process, but, you know, the, the, when we go through renewal, we're set, basically setting the infrastructure for the next 50 years. So what is going in today um, is going to be there probably in 2071. And so are we building the right infrastructure for 2071? I'm not, sh I'm not, I, once again, I'm not a planner. I'm not sure we are, but um, it's worth asking, I guess. And if a heat island map can, can help inform that process, then why not? And uh, Mildred has a question. So in terms of, uh, in terms of heat islands, I know a lot of people think that they're doing the right thing by zero escaping, putting in a river bed, a fake river bed, taking out their lawn, 
putting in river rock and gravel right. and that we're using less water. But I think people need more education about how much that actually heats up the surface of their lawn when they do that. Walking on lawn is actually cooler than walking on gravel. And yeah. walking yeah. on gravel is cooler than walking on pavement, generally because of the color. So these are things that I think people need more education about. And if they're xeriscaping, they should try and be encouraged to xeriscape with plants, not with rocks and gravel and pea gravel and some of the crazy things that I've seen people do with their front lawns in the name of low maintenance. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a really good point, uh, Mildred. Um, yeah, and in my, I mean, this is like a little bit of rant for me, but in my, in uh, in my experience, um, the rocks in the end don't end up being any less maintenance than the lawn because they end up uh, getting, you know, nature nature does its thing, right? And and the the rocks fill up with with leaves and they break down and it turns to soil and then you get weeds and then you get people out there like. I've seen people vacuuming the rocks, which which seems like far more work. <laughs> Very but, cost. Yeah. It's environmentally costly to do that. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good point. Very good point. Um, I want to maybe just draw my draw the attention to a couple messages I'm getting in here. Uh, Barb says, "Is the city open to having community groups plant trees in parks?" Uh, yes and no. There is something called the. Um, there is something called the request to plant project. It's fairly new. Uh, it allows uh, folks to request to plant a tree in a park. Uh, generally, the tree needs to be a fairly large, a fairly large caliper. So the problem with small trees, which is mostly what Transcriber is offering, is they need somebody to tend them. And um, you could imagine facilities if they don't know they're there, kind of like running over a little tree with a lawnmower. Uh, they actually do establish quicker than larger trees, um, uh, just because there's less kind of transplant shock. But um, yeah, at the moment, the city will allow people to plant on public trees if, or sorry, on, in public spaces if they go through that request to plant process. Uh, there is, of course, also uh, community gardens, which is a partners and parks agreement. So that is to say, hey, we're gonna, the city is gonna give you this piece of land here with the agreement that you maintain it. So uh, you can, um, you can plant, um, from my understanding, the city is now allowing some uh, uh, tree propagate or, or tr trees in those spaces, but they are on with with the idea that they are under the care of those communities. Uh, schools are maybe a little bit easier. Church groups are private, so that's fairly easy. Um, schools, the school board typically retains use uh, or or um, autonomy over uh, like a fifty foot envelope around the school. Beyond that, it's often city land. So then, once again, you're, you're resorting to a partners and parks agreement or a, a request to plant. Um, so there's some of those kind of challenges to 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 navigate and, and figure out as well. The other thing too is, you know, if there's a community that's particularly hard hit, um, you know, uh, one of the questions I have been wrestling with uh, when it comes to subscriber is like under what circumstances should subscriber or should a group of people be helping plant trees in private property and on, and what conditions would would that have to meet like would we require them to be uh, front yard trees would we require them, like a certain standard of care for a certain amount of time um, so those are all all things to to that are yet to to be figured out. Um, yeah, another question. Uh, Michelle Nelson says Edmonton also has the Root for Trees program. Great program. So they mostly do naturalization. Uh, a lot of stuff that is like they've, they've been mowing for a long time. And what they're doing is uh, converting that back into uh, native vegetation. Uh, and there's lots more questions here that I feel like I might have to go through this and uh, answer these um, kind of uh, one at a time afterwards. I realized we hit 802. Um, this, as mentioned, is uh, has been recorded. Uh, one of the questions that does come up in the comments is, um, how do we access the recording? So if you signed up for this using Eventbrite, or if you've gone through and joined uh, because you're a member of Subscriber, uh, I will post this and I will send a link out to everybody. And so feel free to um, share it on 
Um, but if, uh, yeah, if, if you signed up through the Eventbrite, I have your email address and I will uh, not spam you, but I will send you a, a link of today's um, presentation. Well, before you send everyone off, Justin, I'd like to just do a quick thank you. So yeah, thanks so much everyone who came out here tonight. Um, it was great to see so much interest and yeah, just interest in our project and in Shrubscriber as well. So hopefully together, like Dustin said, we can raise some awareness on these issues and solutions and work together to build that healthier climate resistant city that we all want. Um, next, I'd just like to quickly thank Dr. Meyer, our professor, I think, pretty sure I saw that her name's here tonight for giving us the opportunity to explore this project and for her guidance and feedback throughout the process and for introducing us to our partner, Dustin. Thank you, Dustin, again, for your amazing efforts and taking us on to yeah, meet with us and figure out project goals and discuss all that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ferber and Kayla Stan for all the GIS help and King's IT for facilitating that. And then our data came from NASA, EcoStress, Appears, City, Edmonton Open Data, Climate Chip, and a few others. So our project, our findings and our maps would not have been possible without any of those people or those organizations. So big thanks. And thank you so much because, um, yeah, this was your involvement, your um, your skills, and your passion for this has, has really shown and has, has made this um, this urban heat island map what it is. And I think you know I can safely say from the the participation tonight that um, it's sparking a lot of conversations. And I think those are the kinds of conversations that we need. So thank you. And thank you everybody for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it, uh, giving us an hour of your time on a Thursday evening. And on that note, we'll, we'll see you later. Bye, thank you. Bye.